Hi, this is JP Merrill. And this is Kenneth Morgan. Today on the Slide Lens, we've got Tola K here with us. We're going to take a look at three great cameras that are kind of that one step down from the absolute best mirrorless cameras, uh, cameras in their classes and by these manufacturers. Specifically, we're going to take a look at the Z6. It's the Z6 II by Nikon, Nikon. New camera, just came out. Really interested to see how it compares with these other cameras and just see exactly what we've got here. So what do you think about these cameras? Well, I'm excited for this because the, the Canon R6 has been out for like half a year and we haven't taken a look at it yet. And then, of course, the Nikon Z6 Mark II, which is hot off the press, brand new from the factory. Uh, it has the same sensor as the old version, but a better processor, so it'll be faster autofocus, uh, less banding, the buffer's like three times faster. All things are really great. And then we have the A7C back. This is a great little camera. We've looked at it already. I'm excited to see how it stacks up against cameras that are really priced a little higher. These are just slightly more premium, have a little bit better features, but I want to see how it pans out because a lot of people choose this just for the size. Let's take a look at these, uh, these cameras. Let's just see how they compare with each other and let's get started, see what we can do. All right, let's take a look at the ergonomics of these three cameras and just see how this new Nikon compares with the uh, contemporaries. Well, I, I like how we have a sort of biggest to smallest here. We do here, yeah. Funnily, I, I usually associate Nikon with bigger cameras because their DSLRs are really big and kind of heavy. Uh, but this is in the, in the mid-range compared to the new Canons, <coughs> which are definitely a lot more hefty. I like, of course, that the Canon has a flip-out screen. Um, I love the Canon's joystick and the dial. The Canon's new body style is just so much better than the one they had for the R. <laughs> Whereas this does not have a flip-out screen. I don't understand any camera company that's trying to get in and, and compete in the video world that has this screen anymore. And that includes yeah. the Sonys, I mean, that have this. I mean, it really needs to have a pop-out screen. I will say my one complaint about the Z bodies is the part near my thumb feels really cramped. There's a lot of buttons here. And I feel like the joystick and this rear dial are both kind of in the wrong spot. It, you have to loosen your grip in order to use either to of these things compared to the Canon. So I think each of these cameras has a lot, of, a lot of things going for them individually in terms of ergonomics. And it really just comes down to a matter of taste and what your personal application is. I mean, some people will think the Sony's perfect, like our friend Andy. Um, I personally really like this Canon body, and I like the size and the dials and everything that includes, and especially the flip-out screen. Yep. But the Nikon comes in a very solid place here because it has a lot of the dials, the things you want, buttons you'd be able to make it very easy to use, and it's very, very small size. It's, it's a very compact camera. It is very compact without compromising too much on you know, holdability, usability. So. Yep. All right, well, there's a look at ergonomics. So we're gonna do the picture quality test. We're just gonna do a kind of waist up, head and shoulder shot on each of the cameras. We're gonna set them at the same camera setting, uh, 320 at uh, 100 ISO at 2.0. So it's a pretty shallow depth of field, just to be able to give us a good look at the bokeh in the background, how the lens is looking, but how the sensor is really giving it and rendering the color. We'll put a spider checker in there just so we can see the colors. We really wanna see what the color science of the sensor looks like this. Image quality test, so here we go. So here's our picture quality test. And the minute you put these up on the screen, it's really obvious to me. The Canon color on the left, you got Nikon color in the middle, and you got Sony on the right. Mm -hmm. And then Canon just has this kind of warmish colors to it. You see it in the yellow, you see it in the greens. You know, then your Nikon is much more kind of neutral. It's a beautiful color. Yeah, and Sony is just a little more greenish, and the color isn't quite as, I mean, you could correct, we've said this yeah. many times, you correct, correct all these everything. to it and match them as Sony's much as you want. Sony's a little darker too, as usual. It is a little bit darker. Well, I mean, all three cameras look great. I am partial to Canon's image, that's just my taste. Mm -hmm. But, you know, manipulate these all sorts of different ways and they'll all look really good. I don't know if there's a clear winner. No, incredible quality <laughs> on all of them. Now we come to my personal favorite test, the dynamic range test. We have Tola here in this window bay area. Bright highlights in the back out the window. We do have a little bit of light on her face because there just wasn't enough in here before. So we've accented what's available just to get a proper ex baseline exposure. And then what we're gonna do is we'll underexpose and overexpose by several stops with all three cameras. And in post, we'll take those images and try and process them, bring them back to normal and see how it works. So here's the dynamic range test. And first off, it's a pretty good example of the fact that you can color correct these sensors to have a match, because Kenneth went through and color corrected these. These look identical almost. They're not exactly identical. Uh, the two, the middle one, Nikon's a little bit warmer than the other yeah. two, but it's, they are so stinging close. So it just shows you that you can, you can correct anything. There are a couple patches here that were gone, that yeah. couldn't be recovered. But that's great, good starting point. 
See a little bit of white, and then we also have some black in the chips in her dress. So minus one stop here on all these cameras. And already you see the background yeah. is now you have all that information. Yeah, when you start underexposing, what you're basically doing is giving a correct exposure to the background. Mm -hmm. It's going to make it so it holds that information. It's easy to open the shadows back up and then recover it. So here's two stops under. Got all the details starting to appear in the back. Three stops under. I mean, we're not seeing much going on here. This is. It's really, so a really clean image. They have a little bit of a warmth in the shadows, mm -hmm. but a little bit of redness. Minus four stops. The wall behind her is super dark at this point. The shadow areas in this scene are really dark at this and point. And they're still super clean on all three cameras. You do see a little, I mean, you do see grain, and you do see a little splotchiness here on the Sony. You see the magenta and the green splotches mm, yeah. appearing. Are we seeing that on the Nikon? A little bit. Maybe a bit. Maybe a tiny bit. Not much though. The Canon is still super clean too. So this is minus, fi minus five stops. There is at this point, I feel like a little bit of color shift uh, in the Sony, in the Nikon. You're starting to see a little bit of ruddiness to the skin tones. Background's going a little green on the Nikon and the Sony. Man, they're holding together really well for minus five stops. And you look at the color chips, I mean, it's all still pretty it's clean. beautiful with that spider checker, it looks great. You know, this is a pretty good example of if you're in a really, really tough dynamic range situation, underexposed, at underexposed. least by two stops. Yeah, two stops, you're perfectly safe because at five stops, it's still usable. Yeah, so two stops <laughs> is going to give you much better detail in the highlights and it's going to give you a much nicer image. Okay. So let's go to the plus one images for these three cameras and just see how they... First off, there's a truck parked in the background that wasn't uh, in the Sony that the isn't Sony, on the other yeah. two. So you can't look at that. you got to look above. But if you just look above it, look at the brown tones that the Sony's still holding yeah. that the uh, Nikon and the Canon are not. Yeah, that Sony's holding on really well to those yep. highlights. The Nikon and the Canon are about the same, which is unusual. Usually the Nikon blows out much faster than everybody else, but they're the same here. Yep. If we go to plus two stops, wow, we just lose it with the Canon and the Sony. No, the Nikon. The Canon the Nikon. Yeah, the Nikon went significantly uh, brighter. The Canon is yeah. a lot brighter, but the Sony is really holding on here. Yeah, it's holding on for dear life. And then we go to plus three, and everything behind her is white now for the Canon and the Nikon. The Sony still retains some detail on the inside of the room, the spindle and everything. I, it's The Sony's got at least a stop, if not a stop and a half, of dynamic range yeah. that you don't see in the Nikon and the Canon. I mean, yeah, you look at this, if we go to plus two on the Canon Nikon, plus three on the Sony, they look very similar. Very similar. So it's about a stop. About a stop, yep. That's pretty awesome. And they were all very similar underexposed down to five stops, and the Sony has a stop advantage in the highlights. That's awesome. It really is. It really means you can, if you underexpose the Sony by a stop, you're going to have tremendous detail in those highlights. Yeah. It's going to help you hold the highlights in a really tough uh, situation where you have bright highlights and, and dark shadows. So, yeah. All right, here's a test we didn't do an intro for. This is the ISO test, and we start here at 400 ISO. We have a mixed lighting situation, so she has the warm light from the piano light, and then we have a little bit of window light coming through the doorway, and then we put a, a little bit of daylight behind her in the room. We start at 400 ISO, even though I think cameras I had these to, days are <laughs> so clean at 400. I had to convince him that 400 was a good idea. And it's, are they, they're pretty clean. If it's you blow them up, are they clean? Super clean. Boy, with noise reduction, I mean, these would just all, the, at 400, you really. It is perfect. Yeah, you're right. You don't see any anything any difference there. It's all pretty clean. If we go to 800 on all these, I think predictably just still a very nice clean image. We do, I mean, you do see a little noise in the background on the wall behind her head. At 1600 ISO, I feel like we definitely start to see the noise. It's present. It's not terrible, and you could easily get rid of that with noise reduction. 3200 ISO. This is usually where these this price bracket breaks. Usually 3, it's about 3200 ISO. You spend all the money you can afford on ISO. Yeah. You don't get 3200. And you see it. I mean, if you blew this up to an 8x10 or something, you would probably be able to see some of the texture back there. The Sony is a little more gritty, but you know, the, the Canon looks pretty dang clean. The Canon looks really clean. I'd say the Canon looks a little better than the Nikon. It does. Even. Yeah. So clean at 3200. I so mean, 6400, they're getting a little gritty. The Canon yeah. is definitely pulling ahead, I think. And Nikon's holding its own, though, and the Sony, though, is struggling. Yeah, it's yeah. you see the grain pattern now all through her face and twelve thousand eight hundred ISO. Yeah, I mean it's really noisy at this point. Yeah, 
I, I probably would avoid shooting this high. But you know what's interesting about them is in the past we have always seen digital noise. You get those kind of reds yeah. and greens start to, yeah. to build, it, especially at 12,800. I'm not seeing that here. No. I'm seeing a grain build, but I'm not seeing a color uh, start to fall apart, but you're definitely seeing the grain pattern, especially in the Sony. 25,600. Yeah, I mean, the Sony's really gritty. The Nikon's okay. No, but you're shooting a wedding that's really dark. I mean, yeah. I would go to 25,600. I mean, it's better to have an emotional yeah, shot yeah, yeah. and true. to have the images than to not that's have true. them at all. And if you turn these black and white, that's it'll true. Just now look, it's cool. It'll just be artistic. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, I'll wow. tell you what. I I do <laughs> feel like 000. I do feel like the Canon has about a well, almost a stop on the Sony. Yeah. I Almost feel like our Nikon is looking the same as the Sony now, too. Yeah, 51,000. I mean, the Sony only goes up so high. That's why these, the, Na the Canon and the Nikon do go another stop, because they can. Yeah. You know, it's still kind of okay. Wow, this is, uh, these, these are very impressive cameras, especially really at this price are. point. You know, they, these are not the most expensive, highest-end cameras in these uh, different manufacturer lines. So it's just, I'm pretty impressed with where it's at. The autofocus was interesting because the Nikon has a new processor and we expected it to perform better than uh, the first I believe when we shot the Z6 Mark I, there was something wrong with it anyways. So I was excited for the Mark II and I thought this is going to be a real knockout with the autofocus because Nikon is traditionally very good with their autofocus systems, especially in the D850, the D780, I mean they're legendary. I was not super impressed with this Nikon. It lagged, it had a really hard time yeah. keeping up. At its best, it did cap it did capture sharp images most of the time. It missed a few here, missed a few there. Yeah. But it, it did pretty well. I mean, the R6 just knocked it out of the park. The R6 was uh, so good. Yeah, the R6 was better than the R5 when we tested it. Yeah. It, it, the R6 was just on just about every time and tracking. The Sony did really good. Uh, it had a few softer images, but really solid performer. So really, to, to wrap this up, I feel like the R6 was stellar, was probably the best in the autofocus test. And then I think next would be the Sony, which mm -hmm. was really good, solid contender. And then the Nikon kind of struggled. It, it mm -hmm. struggled and had a hard time. We also shot some video, because video is a big feature, of course, on all these cameras. And we've talked about how confusing those specs are. And there's one other thing we should mention, that is IBIS, because IBIS is kind of a big deal these days. It and, is a major big deal. And we want to see how it compares. So we shot the video test handheld so we could see how the IBIS performs. The one in the upper left hand corner is way more stable than anything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it's pretty rock solid. Yeah. So I'm thinking that's a Canon, the R6. Yeah. yeah, it is. And then the next one on the right has got to be the Nikon. Yep. And it's pretty solid too. I mean, I don't see a lot of, of movement, but the, uh, the Sony is drifting all over. Um, I was holding as steady as I could. Of course, there is going to be some shake just because I'm a human. The, I think it's just the newer the technology, the better. The Canon R6 has brand new IBIS technology. It's rated for six and a half stops. The Nikon is also rated for six stops. You'll see there's a sort of jitteriness to it. Oh, there is. The Sony, of course, I mean, you can see even when it's small, the Sony does just kind of drift a little bit. So the R6 doesn't have the 4K HQ setting, just the IPB 4K. Uh, it looks really nice. It's sharp. It's clean. We didn't shoot log on these because we figured there are going to be a lot of other log tests out there and that's not what we want to dive into today. But it looks sharp. It looks clean. Uh, I don't see much banding or anything. That might become more of an issue if you shoot in the log profile and then try and correct it. The Nikon looks super clean. It looks a little sharpened to me, yeah. which I, I didn't go in and check and make sure there was no sharpening. Maybe there's something you could turn off there. The Sony, as is kind of typical for them, is a little bit green. Like you see the green in the front of her face. Mm -hmm. And the image overall is a little softer. I feel like this to me feels like it just has no sharpening applied. Yeah. You, know, you could sharpen that up really easily with a, an effect. You can't make this comparison without having this conversation. I put the R6 up and just uh, turned it on while I was cooking one night and I ran through a 29 minute clip, no problem. Then I started the second 29 cl minute clip and 15 minutes in it overheated. It didn't shut the camera down, just the overheat warning on the R6 came up. And, but then I ran out of card at about 20 minutes. And so I turned it off and I started, I put a new card in, started a new uh, recording and about 10 minutes in on the new one, it shut the camera down at that mm, point. So mm -hmm. I had gotten Almost, almost, two, an hour. almost two 30 minute clips out of it before it overheated and just shut down. So the R6, even though it has a great image and it's, the stabilization is wonderful, the IBIS is incredible, it just is not really a video camera you can use, unfortunately. It just isn't. And that's unfortunate to say because it just has everything going for it. 
except for the fact that it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's really sad. So, all right. So, who are these cameras for? How do you how do you see these? How did the Nikon do? This is the first time we've looked at this Nikon, and well, I I was really excited to try it out, and I was kind of let down a little bit. I well, felt like image-wise, of course, it's nice. I mean, they are always they always produce a great image. Um, the autofocus just kind of killed it for me. That was surprising. It yeah. just didn't. Re it really did not perform the way you would expect it to. The Canon R6, in almost every test, the R6 just killed it and came out on top. With the exception of the dynamic range test, which I Sony think we had to hand to the, the Sony. Park. And of course the video that we just talked about. But everything else in terms of image quality and the speed for shooting, the autofocus was incredible, low light was incredible. Um, I have a hard time saying you can pick the R6 when you can't really do video with it. Well, but not so, everyone's going to want video. If you don't want to do video, if you're just <laughs> thinking about stills, then I think the R6 is, a, is, is an incredible camera. Mm -hmm. Well, there you have it. There's a camera for everyone. You know, these decisions really come down to a lot of times, uh, where have you invested your yeah. money in lenses? Because because we're switching over to digital right now, we got the RF lens series that Canon is bringing on. We have now the um, Z series lenses. We've got Nikon that's bringing on. And so you have to decide, I'm going to commit myself to one of these platforms and I'm going to spend mm -hmm. my money on glass there. And hopefully the camera manuf manufacturers will keep cameras coming that will uh, you know, keep up with the technology and allow me to stay with my lens choice. So. All right, there's a great, three great cameras, not the highest in, in this, these manufacturers, but the close to it, the next the one step down, and great, uh, great cameras to choose from. If you're a wedding shooter or video shooters, leave us some comments below, let us know what camera you would choose and why you like and choose the camera that you have, and we'd love to hear from you. So make sure you subscribe here at the Slam Lens and keep those cameras rolling. And keep on clicking.